Okay, so this will be um, a brief lecture on ion selective electrodes. Um, before we can talk about the electrodes, we need to briefly review electrochemistry. I know you've all had electrochemistry in Chem 1B, but it might be a little fuzzy. So we'll just go over the basics we need to ex understand. Um, so a galvanic cell, also called a voltaic cell, uses a spontaneous chemical reaction, a, a redox reaction, to generate electricity. And the net reaction is composed of an oxidation reaction and a reduction reaction. And those are called half reactions because those two halves put together make the whole reaction. You can't have just one half reaction operate. There has to be oxidation and reduction. Um, so this is an, an illustration of a galvanic cell. Um, we have an electrode in each of these beakers, and oxidation will occur at one and reduction at the other. And so reduction occurs at the cathode and oxidation occurs at the anode. That has always been difficult for me to remember. Um, so a couple of ways to, to remember that. Reduction and cathode both start with consonants. Oxidation and anode both start with vowels, okay? Another thing is you could think about a red cat. Reduction occurs at the cathode. Um, so however you remember it. So here we've got, um, we have to separate the reactants into the two half cells because if we just mix this all together, the electrons will be transferred directly from the species being oxidized to the species being reduced and we won't be able to measure anything. So we separate the reactions. This can be done in many different ways, but this illustration we've just got two separate containers. So oxidation is occurring at the anode and remember oxidation is loss of electrons. So oxidation occurs here. Electrons are lost here by the cadmium and those electrons need to get over here to the reduction half reaction, but they can't go directly, and so they have to go through a wire, through a potentiometer, through another wire, and then they can get over here where they can um, reduce the silver ion. Um, in order for us to not have a buildup of charge, we need to have some way for uh, the the counter ions to be able to move and maintain charge neutrality. So we have a salt bridge here. Uh, the salt bridge can take many forms. Um, here it's probably just a glass tube with some sort of an um, electrolyte solution in there and probably um, some sort of a porous membrane at the end. Here it says porous glass plates. Something that will keep the solution inside but allow um, ions to move. Okay, so the potentiometer here is going to measure the difference in electric, electric potential between the anode and the cathode. Okay, any questions so far? Do you remember hearing about this? Yeah. Am I actually, am I actually tutoring this? <laughs> yeah, you're actually tutoring this right now, right? Yeah, so electricity is produced because the cell reaction is not at equilibrium. If we were to allow these electrons to just flow unimpeded, then the concentrations would continue to change until it established an equilibrium and then no more electrons would flow. We don't want that to happen. At that point, the, the voltage would be zero and there's nothing interesting going on. So this potentiometer has a high resistance which limits the amount of current that could flow. So we can measure the voltage difference while allowing a very small amount of current to pass. And so we're not actually going to be changing the concentrations of the solution substantially. Okay, so the cell voltage the difference in electric potential between those two electrons is going to depend on the concentrations of the reactants. And the relationship is given by the Nernst equation. We're not going to do any calculations, but we need to have an idea of how it depends on it. So the potential of the cell, or the voltage of the cell, is equal to the cell voltage under standard conditions 
that would be one molar concentrations of any aqueous substances. Um, for solids, it would be the pure solid. For gases, it would be one atmosphere. Minus this constant, 0.05916, divided by N. N is the moles of electrons that are transferred in the redox reaction. So when you balance the two half, put the two half reactions together, the number of electrons on each side is that N. And it's, so it's this, this number here times the base 10 log of Q. Q is the um, reaction quotient. And that's calculated in exactly the same way as an equilibrium constant is, where you take the concentrations of the products raised to the power of their coefficient, and you divide by the concentrations of the reactants also raised to their coefficients. Any solids or liquids or gases, pure substances, um, are left out because their concentrations don't change. The difference between Q and K, the equilibrium constant, is that the equilibrium constant is measured at equilibrium. And Q is measured at some set of concentrations, whatever it happens to be. So the concentrations of the species being oxidized and reduced are found within this Q. Okay, so the cell voltage is related to the logarithm of that quotient. Any questions? So the reason we're talking about this really at all is that, that um, glass pH electrodes are ion selective electrodes that are very, very commonly used. And I think you can be better at using um, pH electrodes if you have a basic understanding of how they work. So an ion selective electrode in general is not actually based on a redox, redox process or a specific redox reaction. They're based on the selective binding of one particular type of an ion, that's where we get ion selective, that ion to a membrane, and that's going to generate a potential. So in the combination glass pH electrode, we actually have a complete galvanic cell with two electrodes in a single probe. So you don't have two separate beakers, you just have a single probe that you can dip into your sample and measure the pH. The line notation for the electrode is down here. We have two different reference electrons, electrodes. They're both silver, silver chloride electrodes. And the potential difference comes because of this glass membrane. So we've got an outer reference electrode, and, and that is in contact with um, the acid or the hydrogen ion concentration that's outside of the electrode, that's what we're measuring. And we have an inner reference electrode that um, uses a set hydrogen ion concentration that is not going to change. This is part of the electrode. And because these concentrations are different, even though the processes are the same, you get a potential difference or a voltage across. So Here's an illustration of this glass membrane that separates the inner and outer um, electrodes. And the glass becomes hydrated. It's silicon and oxygen bonded together. Um, and it frequently has sodium ions associated with these negative oxygen um, negative oxygens. Um, the sodiums can move. They'll move very, very slowly. Um, but the hydrogens will s selectively bind to the sides of the glass membrane. It's going to be hydrated, and so the outer, both sides of the gel, I'm sorry, the glass, will be hydrated. And that's important, and we'll talk about that later. So here's a schematic of the glass pH electrode. And they are not all the same, but they, they operate on the same idea. So here we have this glass membrane. Inside the glass membrane is a 0.1 molar HCl solution that's saturated with silver chloride. And then we have um, solid silver chloride paste um, between uh, two sides of a folded silver wire. So that functions as a silver silver chloride um, electrode. So that's one of the half cells. It's connected not through a salt bridge, but through a porous plug through the, the solution that you put the um, electrode into, the analyte solution, to the outer electrode. 
So the outer electrode here, we have a silver-silver wire um, that's, uh, we have a silver wire that also has the silver chloride paste on it, and we have an aqueous filling solution out here that's saturated with silver chloride and potassium chloride. They use saturated solutions because we don't want the concentrations to change much at all. Okay, so because the hydrogen ion concentration in here is different than out there, there's a voltage difference, and that can be measured by running these two leads to a pH meter, which is just a specialized potentiometer. Any questions? Does that make any sense? You guys awake? Yeah. Okay. It's coming back. Yeah. Okay. So using a glass pH electrode is, is pretty straightforward, uh, but I'd just like to go over that. Of course, you should always um, follow the manufacturer's instructions, but they generally fall along the same lines. Um, before using the electrode, you should always rinse it with DI water and gently blot it dry like with a Kim wipe just to get the extra water off. Why would you want to get that water off the electrode? before you put it in your sample. No, the sample is aqueous. But what if we add water to our sample? You're going to dilute it. That may or may not be significant, but we don't want to mess around with that. So you rinse it, you blot it dry so there's not a lot of water hanging on it, and then you dip the electrode into your solution that you want to measure the pH you need to allow the e electrode to equilibrate. And ideally, you should have stirring to make sure that every everything's going to equilibrate. It'll probably take 30 seconds to a minute. Um, you can be watching the pH on the meter. You may see some fluctuations. You need to wait until that settles down. When you're finished, you would rinse it again, pat it dry, and then store it in a buffer. Usually they're stored either in a pH 4 or a pH 7 buffer to prevent dehydration of the glass. Now, if you're going to use it um, just in another sample very soon, you could rinse it and set it down, or you could just go directly to another sample, but you don't want that, that electrode just sitting on the counter or hanging from a ring stand for an extended period of time because the glass will dry out. It needs to be hydrated, and if it's allowed to dry out, then you're going to have to condition it and equilibrate it again, and you'll lose time doing that. pH meters, pH electrodes need to be calibrated. They need to be calibrated before every use, and um, they also, that calibration needs to be repeated during sustained use. Uh, the reference I was looking at said probably at least every two hours you need to calibrate it again. To calibrate it, you would usually use um, two different buffer solutions. The, the electrodes should be calibrated at the same temperature as the solutions that you're going to measure because the um, electrode or the cell potential does depend somewhat on temperature. So you want to have the same temperature. Um, so you would calibrate it with two standard buffers and you would choose pH values that bracket your expected pHs that you're going to measure. So if you're expecting that your sample is going to be pH 8, you'd want to choose two buffers that bracket that, maybe pH 6 and pH 10 or something, but just make sure that they're on each side. Of course, there are sources of um, error in pH measurements. Um, the accuracy of, of a pH measurement using a glass electrode is limited to about plus or minus 0.02 pH units. That's a best case scenario. That would correspond to uncertainty of plus or minus 5% in the hydrogen ion concentration. So for most purposes, that's, that's fine. Um, the two things that limit the accuracy the most are the accuracy of the buffer standards. So you make a buffer standard, and the pH of that buffer, how well you know that is going to affect how you can standardize your pH meter, and so it's going to affect the accuracy of all of your pH measurements. Typically, those are going to have an uncertainty of plus or minus 0.01 pH unit. The other thing that contributes to error is the junction potential. There's a junction potential at that porous plug that connects the two cells. 
uh, due to differences in ionic composition of the standard and the sample. And that will typically be at least plus or minus 0.01 pH units. Um, so those are the ones that have the biggest contribution to um, error in the pH measurements. Um, some other factors um, include junction potential drift. So that junction potential can drift, gradually change over time. And that's going to cause your pH measurements to drift as well. And you can compensate for that by recalibrating every two hours. Another possible error is called the sodium error or the alkaline error. This happens when the concentration of hydrogen ions is very low. That's going to happen at a very high pH. And the sodium ion concentration is high because the glass will also bond or, or react with the um, sodium ions. And so if you have very little hydrogen present, the electrode will respond to sodium ions instead and give you a pH that's erroneously low. So it's going to suggest that there's more hydrogen ions than are actually present. So you'll get a pH reading that's too low. That can happen at um, high pH values. Um, an acid error happens at the other end of the pH scale. If you're measuring a strong acid, the measured pH may be too high. Um, one possibility for that happening is that the glass becomes saturated with hydrogen ions, so basically it maxes out and it just can't, it can't change its potential um, in response to the hydrogen ions anymore. And so the pH will go down to a certain level and then it won't go any lower. So your pH may be higher than it should be. Equilibration time can cause error. If you have a well-buffered solution and adequate stirring, uh, the electrode sh should equilibrate in about 30 seconds. Um, so waiting a minute is, is going to be just fine. If your solution is not buffered or poorly buffered, you may need to wait several minutes for the pH to settle down for it to become equilibrated. If you read the pH on the meter before it has adequately equilibrated, then you're going to have an error in your pH measurement. The glass needs to be properly hydrated in order to respond to hydrogen ions correctly. If it's not properly hydrated, that will give you errors in your measurements. Uh, calibration and your pH measurements need to be done at the same temperature. Now, if you're working in a lab where things have been sitting around and everything's at room temperature, no problem. But if you're calibrating and maybe out in the field and you're using this pH meter in different types of solutions and some of them are warm and some of them are cold, that's going to be a problem. If you expose your glass electrode to hydrophobic li liquids, such as methylene chloride or oils or fats, those can foul the glass membrane and cause it to not respond correctly. They're not going to rinse off with water because they're hydrophobic, and so they'll need to be cleaned with an appropriate solvent, and then you have to condition the electrode to make sure that the glass is properly hydrated again. Any questions? So there are, we talked about the, the glass um, pH electrode. That was a combination electrode. There are also um, glass electrodes for pH that are not combination, and then you have to have a separate reference electrode. There are other types of ion selective electrodes. pH uh, sensors are the most common, but you can also find um, electrodes for many different ions. So one type is a solid state ion selective electrode. These electrodes use a doped inorganic crystal as the ion selective membrane. And so here's a diagram. You're going to have um, your silver, silver chloride reference electrode in here in a filling solution, and then some sort of an inorganic crystal here. Notice this is a single half cell, and so you would need a reference cell with this, and the lead goes off to the potentiometer. Um, the sorts of crystals that are used are things like lanthanum fluoride, silver chloride, silver iodide, silver sulfide, um, and these are generally doped with another element to cause them to be sensitive to a given ion. So here are the ions. Um, 
that can be measured with solid state electrodes. These are the concentration ranges that are available. Um, it's quite a large range of concentrations. Um, the pH range for some of these is limited. Like for sulfide, you're only going to be able to use this in a pH range of 13 to 14. And there may be interfering species. So if these ions are present, it's not going to function well. Any questions? Liquid-based electrons, electrodes, <laughs> liquid-based electrons. Liquid-based ion selective electrodes use a hydrophobic membrane that's impregnated with a hydrophobic ion exchanger. It's called an ionophore. And that ionophore is selective for the analyte of interest. So here, you know, the overall design of these is very, very similar. You've got your filling solution. You've got your silver-silver chloride electrode in here. It's all encased in some sort of a protective covering. And then at the bottom here, instead of an ionic crystal, you've got a polymer membrane that has some sort of an ion exchanger in it with a, an ion-selective ionophore. So here are the primary ions that can be uh, detected. Here are detection limits for those. Um, these are in micromolar. Um, so, you know, small quantities, but not necessarily as low as you might need for like a water analysis, looking for trace things. Um, there's a selectivity coefficient um, so that you can calculate the sort of interference that you might have from different, different ions. And if you know the concentration of those ions, you can determine whether they're actually going to be a problem or not. Any questions about those? Compound electrodes. Um, these have a conventional electrode that's surrounded by a membrane that either isolates or generates the analyte to which the electrode responds. Um, and the, the one example that was given in the Harris book was the Severinghaus CO2 electrode. This is um, very useful in monitoring CO2 levels in, in patients, in humans. Um, so the basic idea here, you've got this electrode. Um, it's basically a pH electrode. But then on the outside of it, you've got a CO2 permeable membrane. And that's held away from the glass membrane with a spacer. And then you've got you need some sort of a weak electrolyte in there. So we have a weak electrolyte in there with a bicarbonate buffer. As the CO2 enters through the membrane, it changes the pH of that solution, and the electrode responds to that change in pH. So this can be used to measure CO2 in gases or in liquids, like in blood. So any questions? There are different ways to measure CO2. Um, this severing house electrode has some limitations. Its, its useful range is, is a little bit odd, but it turns out that that is perfect for measuring CO2 levels in human blood. And so that's why it's used so much. So some advantages of ion selective electrodes. Um, they're going to be much less expensive than competitive alternatives such as atomic spectroscopy or ion chromatography, right? You don't need this big setup and a computer and all of this stuff. You need a meter and an electrode. So much less expensive. The, the linear response um, to the log of the activity, these, these electrodes don't actually measure concentration they measure activity of the ion. I'll, I'll mention exactly what that is in a minute. But they, they respond to the log of activity over four to six orders of magnitude. So there's a wide range over which they can be used effectively. Ion selective electrodes are, are non destructive and they're non contaminating. So you can sample ions without destroying or contaminating what you're sampling. They have a short response time 
Now their response time is you know going to be on the order of a minute, five minutes maybe. Um, that response time compared to how much time it would take you to run the sample on an IC, right? Short response time. They're unaffected by color or turbidity. So you've got a dark, darkly colored solution where spectroscopy might not work because the colors are interfering. The ion selective electrode doesn't care. It's turbid, it's, it's cloudy, doesn't matter. Um, ion selective electrodes can be made in, in very small sizes, microelectrodes, and these can be used inside living cells. This was actually my graduate uh, research project. I was trying to make a microelectrode that would be sensitive to glucose. Um, it would be about 10, 10 to 20 micrometers in diameter, and you could actually stick it into individual cells. Um, unfortunately, it, it didn't go very well, but it would have been cool if it had worked. There are some things you need to consider when using ion selective electrodes. Um, the precision. The precision rarely exceeds 1%, and it's often lower than 1%. Um, so, you know, if you, if you need a very tight value, um, ion selective electrodes are probably not the way to go. The error that we see increases for divalent and trivalent ions. And that has to do with the Nernst equation where you have the N. And so the number of electrons being moved around um, is going to affect the error. Ion selective electrodes can be fouled by proteins or other organic solutes, so that can be an issue. Um, some of the electrodes are fragile, and so, you know, you bump, bump into something and you've broken it. Others may have a limited shelf life. Um, some of these electrodes, especially the, um, oh, I forgot the name of them, the compound electrodes. One of the ways you can make a compound electrode, which is kind of what I was trying to do, is you can use enzymes here. The enzyme reacts with the substrate. You can use glucose oxidase. It will react with glucose, and then you can, um, you can monitor the electrodes, electrons that are transferred from the glucose oxidase. So if you're dealing with anything with an enzyme, then you're going to have some limited shelf life. Um, um, as we noted earlier, other ions may interfere, so that can be a problem. And then it's important to remember that we're measuring the activity of uncomplexed ions. So if the ion of interest is being complexed, remember those complex ions from 1B? Um, a complex ion will not register. The ion selective electrode will be completely blind to it. Now, if you want to measure just the uncomplexed ion, like in human blood, there's free calcium, and there's also calcium that's complexed in different ways. If you want to measure the free calcium, then an ion selective electrode's awesome because it won't see the others. Um, but you need to be aware of that. So the ligands um, for your analyte must either be absent or masked if you want to measure the total concentration. And then we're measuring activity. So activity is related, is affected by ion strength of the solution. The more ions that are present in solution, the lower the activity. If we measure, um, if we keep the ionic strength constant, say between the buffer solutions that were, um, or the standard solutions that we're calibrating with and the solution that we're measuring, then the the issue of activity goes away and it can be calibrated according to concentration because the uh, concentration is proportional to the activity. But if you have different ionic strengths, then you may have a problem. Any questions? One way to get around this issue of um, ionic strength, especially when you're calibrating, is to use what's called a standard addition method. So if you think of, you know, you're, you're analyzing something, let's just say calcium, in a sample, and you don't know exactly what else is in that sample, the matrix, right, all the other things that are in there, um, then it's hard to set up 
standards that are in the same matrix. Other times you may know what the matrix is, but it's super complicated, and who wants to go through the hassle of making that for your standards? I mean, we've made lots of standard curves, right? And you'd like it to be simple rather than having to make up something really complicated. So it's important that the matrix of the calibration standard is really close to the matrix of the sample being analyzed. And that can be difficult to do if you have a complex or an unknown matrix. So we can use a standard addition method. So the basic idea here is first you would measure the potential of the sample that you're interested in. So you put the pH, or it's not pH, you put the electron, the ion selective electrode in your sample, you let it equilibrate, equilibrate, and then you record the potential on the potentiometer. Then what you're going to do is you're going to add small volume aliquots of your standard. So if you're, if you're looking at calcium, you're going to add calcium ions to the sample itself in small volumes. The small volume assure, ensures that the ionic strength of the solution doesn't change much. You're not really altering the matrix very much. So you add some calcium. The potential changes. You record that. You add more calcium. The potential changes again. You record that. And so you can make your standard curve actually in your sample. And that can be graphed in a linear way, and you can determine um, the actual concentration that way. Um, you know, this, this is not an ideal, necessarily an ideal method, but it, it, it works really well in certain situations. Another possibility is that you can spike your sample with um, a high ionic strength. So make it very, very concentrated. Um, and then the, the differences aren't going to matter. You just make your standards and you add ions to your unknown so that everything has a high ionic strength and that gets around the problem as well. Any questions? And that's the one. Why do you guys sum up more than one? Uh, 